Hello and behind me is the North American F-105 Thunder Chief and this is the fifth of my videos on the Century series. Now this aircraft was designed to be a low altitude, high speed penetration bomber. In fact, it had a bigger bomb load than the B-17 from World War II, thus showing how fast aircraft are developing. In this series, we have worked our way through from the F-100, which took part in the ZLL testing, where they stuck a rocket to its underside, allowing immediate takeoff. The extremely powerful F-101 with its air-to-air -air nuclear missiles, the first USAF Delta Wing F-102, the missile with a man, and now we're looking at the F-105. And a massive thanks to the National Museum of the USAF in Dayton for letting me film this aircraft. I have many more videos on my channel that were filmed here. Originally designed to sneak into enemy territory quickly at low altitude, drop a nuke and then escape, but after already being developed, it was then used for direct attack and enemy missile suppression, which I'll mention more later. The original of two YF-105As first flew in 1955 and were powered by the less potent J-57 turbojet engine and the following year the YF-105B first flew with the production J-75 engine and fuselage modifications including narrowing of the waistline over the wings after seeing what Convair had learned with the F-102 and the area rule which I explain in that video. When it did enter service, it was the largest single-engine combat aircraft in history, weighing over 50,000 pounds. This actual aircraft started life as a F-505F, which was a lengthened two-seater trainer. It was converted to the F-105G Wild Weasel configuration in 1972, where it remained in operation until 1980. We'll start at the nose with the pitot tube, and behind that was the radome covering the radar antenna. Under here is an electronic countermeasure antenna, which could identify an incoming missile and blast it back to confuse its homing system. Behind that is the forward-facing strike camera. Up here is a single 20mm M61 Gatling type cannon. Here's an example with a transparent covering and they used to bleed engine air and blow it into this compartment to ensure that the gun's exhaust would be expelled through these little vents rather than build up in here and potentially explode itself. They carried 1028 rounds which would last 12 seconds so you would have to fire in short bursts so that you wouldn't run out quickly and to avoid the barrels overheating and melting. One of the advantages of using a single engine is that the fuselage would remain fairly narrow which reduces the radar cross section. The engine itself is also sunk well inside the fuselage as the turbine blades are known to light up on a radar. The problem was though that the ground approach radar often couldn't pick up the aircraft so this radar deflector was added to the landing gear to help the aircraft draw attention to itself during the landing. Obviously, this would be hidden inside the wheel well once they were over hostile territory. Now let's check out the side mounted air intakes which, as I've said in previous videos, keeps the nose free for the radar and avoids the problem of how to move the air past the cockpit. This is the boundary layer splitter plate to remove the rough air from entering the engine and you've got these vents here where the boundary layer air from the splitter plate itself would also be removed. On the outer side of this intake is this contraption which would move further forward along this track as the aircraft speeds increase. It would create a shock wave and this would then cross the inlet and slow the incoming air so that it was subsonic by the time it reached the engine. Taking a step back and this whole intake is a rather unusual shape and that was to ensure that air could still enter the inlet at high angles of attack. Now with some other designs, when the aircraft was aggressively angled upwards, the air would hit the underside of the inlet lip, but not actually enter it, while this would still catch enough of the air to send it to the engines. Now let's check out this wing, which interestingly was completely flat and swept at 45 degrees. It's a smaller sized wing, which increases the wing loading ratio, which essentially means that it's a big plane with a small wing. This reduces lift, so it has to compensate with high takeoff and landing speeds. But it also reduces drag, thus allowing for higher speeds, and also makes it less susceptible to gusts of wind, which makes it ideal for low altitude penetration, which you may remember was an original requirement for this program. The wing was very thin, which did reduce drag, but also meant that there was no space inside of it to store fuel, hence why it had to have multiple external fuel tanks. 
Here we are looking at it from behind and it highlights how flat and thin the wing really is. On this external pylon, of which there were five, is an AGM-45 Shrike anti-radiation missile, which was essentially an AIM-7 Sparrow with a different seeker head. They were useful, although the range was less than the North Vietnamese SA-2 rockets, and they were also much slower, therefore they could be hit before hitting the SAM site itself. The missiles also didn't have the capability to remember where the radar was, so if they quickly turned off the radar, the missile would lose track of it and then miss the target. But even if they didn't destroy the SAM radars, Vietnamese ground crews would leave the radars turned off as to avoid being attacked, therefore allowing more aircraft in undetected. As I said before, there was no room inside the wings to store fuel, therefore these external fuel tanks would be used to help boost the jet's range. There is also a centerline fuel tank, as you can see here, but under that was a large bomb bay with a capacity of 12,000 pounds of ordnances, including rockets, missiles, conventional bombs, and even nuclear bombs such as this Mark 57 sitting in front of an F-111, or another fuel tank. Looking down, and we have the main landing gear with very long struts to raise the height of the whole aircraft to allow for the fuel tank and armaments underneath. Of interest, looking inside the main gear wheel well, we have this closed air intake which would actually allow for more air to enter the engines during takeoff when the landing gear was down. Moving our way further aft, we have this ventral fin which improved lateral stability. If you look closely, you'll notice a red pipe and this was a drain for any fluids including oil or fuel that might build up inside the fuselage and it leaks out here. Above this is an engine bay ram air intake which, as the name suggests, takes in air into the fuselage which cools the engine and also provides positive pressure to help push out any of that fluid that may have accumulated in there. Moving back, we have a single vertical fin with a number of electronic countermeasure antennas on top. At the base was a ram air intake for air cooling the afterburner. Moving back down here is a tail hook. Now Air Force runways all had a rest of wires at the end of them that could be employed to catch a plane before it overruns and this was never considered for use on an aircraft carrier. Here's an all moving tailplane which had the added benefit of improving responsiveness but also smooth not having hinges and panel gaps that a semi fixed tailplane would have and this all improved top speed. Powering this was a Pratt & Whitney J75 turbojet with an afterburner and also water injection. With the latter two activated, it produced an incredible 26,500 pounds of thrust, pushing it to a top speed of Mach 2.1 with a service ceiling of 48,500 feet. Of interest, the water had to be all used up before they gained altitude, otherwise it could freeze and potentially explode the tank. It had quite a novel exhaust, as these four petals here could be deployed to act as speed brakes. Here's an example of one here, although they'd have to ensure that the lower petal would be raised during rotation and landing so that they wouldn't hit the runway, and the top petal could interfere with the landing parachute. When the afterburner was used, they would open a little to allow the hot gas out, but when taxiing on the ground, they would open further to reduce the pressure of the exhaust, thus saving the brakes as it was a very powerful engine even at idle. The F-105 was best known for its role as a wild weasel during the Vietnam War. This here is an SA-2 system including a launcher and an inert missile. It was an advanced Soviet system that would be mounted on wheels so that it could be quickly moved. The F-105s would arrive before the main strike force and destroy these enemy SAM systems or just intimidate them into remaining turned off, otherwise the Shrike missile I mentioned earlier could be used to target the radiation from the radars. Its other role was to draw the attention of the SA-2 missiles as they would produce a long white cloud when they were fired and after avoiding the missile itself with particular maneuvers, they then attack the base of the white smoke. Here's some incredible images of an SA-2 exploding just underneath an RF-4C near Hanoi. You can make out the black smoke of the ejector seats as the plane disintegrates. Both crews survived the crash, but sadly one died as a POW. They were incredibly brave flyers and will be the first into and the last out of a hostile zone. This here is an electronic countermeasure pod and you'll notice that there's a propeller on the front to help generate energy as these would be using a lot of it. 
These would emit high-powered radio signals to confuse enemy radars and incoming missiles, although they would often interfere with their own anti-radar missiles and take away another hardpoint, which could otherwise be used for a missile. With later models, including this one, they integrated internal ECM jamming equipment in these blisters on the side of the fuselage, thus eliminating the need for the pods. This down here is a General Dynamics AGM-78 anti-radiation missile, developed in response to the much smaller Shrike's limitations, such as the poor range. This could be launched 90 kilometers from the target. It could also remember the radar's location, so even if it quickly turned itself off, it could still remember where it was, and it could also turn 180 degrees so the aircraft didn't need to be angled directly at the target when firing. It also had a much larger warhead, creating a much larger hull. They were fitted with air-to-air -air refueling probes, which would fold out of this position just forward of the cockpit. They did test buddy refueling, although that never made it into production. They would burn through most of their fuel with the takeoff and the climb, therefore they'd plan to immediately meet a tanker just minutes after takeoff. This is an F-105G model which had two crew positions. In front was a pilot, and here's photos thanks to the museum. Behind him was the navigator, an electronic warfare officer, and they had dual controls which meant that the back guy also had a control stick. Here is an F-105D on display here with a single cockpit. It's in the original livery and called Memphis Bell II in reference to the B-17F that had the same name during World War II. The two red stars here signify the two MiGs shot down. The D model was the definitive production model and was all weather capable with an AN-ANP-131 navigation radar and 610 of those were built. I mentioned nuclear bombs before, and here's the launch button that would have changed history but was thankfully never used. It was nicknamed Thud, and there's conflicting stories about this. Some said that it was the noise made when it hit the ground, because a lot of them were lost in crashes. Others said that it was named after the TV character Chief Thunder Thud, while others said that it was just short for Thunder Chief. Production ended in 1964, with the preferred strike aircraft being the F-4 Phantom II and the planned F-111, although these wild weasel variants continued until 1984, when it was replaced by a specialised F-4G wild weasel. I hope you enjoyed the video and please check out my channel for many other similar videos, and coming up next will be my tour around the F-106 Delta Dart. Thanks for watching.